I wanted the tutorial to be on Friday, and uh, when I realized that uh, I have to do that and realized you have a workshop, so the only way to do it is to switch the lecture and tutorial. So, so there is a change, but the, today we still have a tutorial too, and we'll talk about the handedness. So I will mention this throughout the lecture. So you always had left-handed things, uh, I don't know, left-handed fermion, right-handed fermion, and then the whole tutorial has the point that says, no, you can't say that. It's very ambiguous, what do you mean? There are two definitions, and then they are all bad definitions. <laughs> Unless, you know, you go to the mass list limit, then they happily agree with each other. Except we don't have mass list fermion, so <laughs> there is that. Well, unless you believe in supersymmetry. <laughs> okay. No, there is still, but we haven't discussed. There is still a bit discussed. Okay. No, there is also another thing, very silly, that I realized Dropbox, when they say you click a button, says a copy link, it doesn't copy the link. So I made like a seven or eight submission. They all go to the same Dropbox. So, 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 so it's good in the sense that I just to stop worrying about which link you submit, just find the link in the lower half and click. It will go to the Dropbox I check. I, I, I figure that if I, 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 this is not the first time I made this mistake, and I just decide to forget about it, and, <laughs> and stop trying spending another, you know, 10 minutes to make like a 10 link and a copy and realize they are the same link. And then, yeah, I, I saw like, all the submission up to like 10.45 last night. Anyway. So then I realized, oh, why everybody is submitting today? And then somebody <laughs> sent me email says, there is an error there. So, OK. What else I need to say before I start? I don't think so. OK. I hope they clip this part out <laughs> when they record it. <laughs> About how the lecture doesn't know how Dropbox misfunction. Okay, so let's recap that uh, what do we have done yesterday is so we write down the Dirac equation. As you throw out the psi experience, you realize we have an interview, but we don't really require you to memorize things. But I do hope you, you remember the Iraq equation. Just a note. And um, then we realize that in order this guy to be a good equation, i.e. that it's a relativistic equation, all the goodness we require out of this guy is around that point. They have some properties. And I'm sure you are very familiar with these properties now that you finish the homework. And uh, what else we do? We say, OK, in order this thing to be relativistic, Compatible with Lorentz, transformation per se needs to be transformed in a certain way. And we even figure out what's this certain way as exponential map, which you guys also have practice with. And the important thing is that this generator is just the commutator of the gamma matrix. So you, you will say somebody defined here with a quarter, with an I, whatever, but the point is this thing, everybody agrees. And everybody agrees with the generator is proportional to the commutator of the gamma matrix, just because it's anti-symmetric. And what else did we do? Oh, we actually figure out, in particular, that if the Lorentz transformation is a rotation, we could write this guy down.
and uh, in the homework you have already worked out the, how the post look like there's a crucial difference there's no i also the bottom half doesn't look like exactly the same there's a minus sign showing so this is what we have seen so far up to now, because the homework is due like several minutes ago. <laughs> okay. So, and I also ask what's so nice about this uh, transformation, and a lot of you guys already indicate, uh, already know that what we're going to talk about in the first half of the lecture. And they even give me names. But uh, the important thing is to realize, oh, look, it's so nice. It was supposed to be an exponential map, an exponential of a matrix, supposed to be really, really complicated to calculate. Well, unless it's block a diagonal, we just bring it in. So what does block a diagonal? So we are looking for the representation of Lorentz transform Formation, and we found one. What does block diagonal mean if we find uh, Lorentz transformation is actually these are all the generators. There are three rotation, three boots, all captured in this representation. What does block diagonal mean? If you find a representation is block diagonal for all the generators, it means question mark. It's reducible. It's reducible. Okay, great. See, so this, is, this is awesome. And also because we choose this while representation, KLREL representation, we could just split this thing to be the upper half and the lower half. I'm just writing a W because it's called the while representation. It's called the while spinner. Half of this is called the while spinner. And you will say precisely what do I mean by half of the Dirac spinner is called a well spinner in the tutorial today? But the idea is you can just split up, and then you realize both of them and their rotation transform the same way. And for a boost, they differ by a minus sign. But the key point is they don't mix. So if I just study half of a Dirac spinner, which is simpler, well, smaller dimension, it's only two-dimensional. And of course, you ask that we did this in a particular representation. You would imagine that in a different representation, it's probably not block diet. Because they say the group is reducible is you can find one representation that it's block diagonal, then it's always reducible. It didn't say it's always block diagonal. What if I start out with a different representation? Or what if I want to do this splitting, split Dirac spinner into two different half, and uh, we want to have the similar property is that uh, they are two irreducible representations. It's not a just you know a random chop, a random split, and after Lorentz transformation, they transform differently. Then, then, then there's a problem, right? Okay. So how to nicely split things into like two half or whatever? You know, in quantum mechanics, you probably learned you use things to split things. Okay. I'll see the keyword. We use things called the projection operator. Yeah, you are familiar with them? To some extent? Not very good. What are the good properties of projection, projection operators? Question mark. It's a neopotent. Not a neo, right? I don't know. If, they, if you project onto something and you want to project on this thing again, you get the same thing. Very good. And 
Other? Permission. Permission. Excellent. And, uh, huh? Yeah? Protection operator. Some to identity. Very good. If I have multiple protection operator, if I want it to be complete. And what else? If I project, well, this is more like uh, nice properties. If I project in, into one of things, and then, then I ask, how about now I want to project to something else? If they are irreducible, then it will be zero. But if they have... Uh -huh. But we are talking about the reducible. Very good. So this should be zero. And... Uh, Again, we have to emphasize, I think I have seen at least a uh, hundred times, Lawrence. I don't know how many more times I'll see. That if we find, find such a thing, it better be Lawrence invariant. You don't want to define as a projection operator. It's different for different observers, right? So we need something that is Lorentz scalar and a square to itself and all this good property. And in particular, what do we mean it's Lorentz invariant? Yeah. Where? Does it have to be Hermitian? I don't understand. For a projection operator? I guess, well, maybe not necessarily, but we're going to find, well, the thing we're going to find is observable. So wait, wait, okay. So for general projection operator, maybe this requirement is a even, even nicer property. So these are nicer property that, uh, in our case, happen to be true. But you should definitely have this and that. OK. So then we want it to be Lorentz compatible. In particular, that means it should commute with Lorentz generator. to succeed there is a mathematical theorem says that if the only thing the only matrix you can find that a commute with all your generators is identity or a multiple of identity then you showed that it's irreducible so we're going to use the reverse of that theorem says we already know our representation is reducible, so we must be able to find some matrix fits our bill, commute with all the generator, which is not identical. It's an interesting matrix, as all of you guys found yesterday. Such thing indeed exists. Or at least you guys all found a thing. Well, you're given a thing, and then you showed that it anti-commute with all the other gamma matrices, which is somehow called a gamma five. I guess it's a fifth gamma matrix. I don't argue with how they name things. And you find this thing is particularly nice. It anti-commutes with all the other gamma matrices. Oh, you also showed that it's a Hermitian, so it is nice. Our property is also satisfied and a gamma five square to one. And it because so this you have shown is true, but now we have two of them. There's some a quarter somewhere. But the point is, if you have a pair of them, you can anti-commute through one of them and anti-commute with the other, and then you get a minus sign, minus sign, and then you get a plus. So, okay, let me just write this by its name, which is Lorentz generator. So this thing is what do we want. So how do you think we can build our projection operator with this square to one? And uh, so, what do we have is this thing. So now we can just check 
It's one half plus something, one half minus something. So obviously this thing is complete. It's sum to one. And if you square this guy, and you get one plus two gamma five plus gamma five square, which is one, which gives back yourself. And uh, you can also show, since it's only one line, I'll just write it down, says you can show that indeed it's also orthogonal. It says one minus gamma five square, which is one. Zero. So this thing indeed fits our purpose. And what people do, for example, standard model people, well, actually, there are, standard, there are two kinds of standard model people, at least. The, 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 this category is not a complete. But there are the standard model people decided to use that to describe the well spinner. And there are the standard model people who just directly use the two component spinner. So if you look into textbooks, and there are two formalism. So, so this thing is what we want, that they nicely separate Dirac spinner into two irreducible representation. Those irreducible representation actually are not equivalent. If you read lecture notes, there's one line to show that uh, the upper half transform like something times the lower half, like the complex conjugate of the lower half. So if you have e equivalent representation, they should just be related by a uniform tr unitary transformation, but they can't, they are not. Okay, so of course you will ask, why do I care? Well, it's simpler, simpler is nice. The other thing is, in reality, our world is Carol. Like Carol and the while, it's apparently they, they are equal. So this word, those two words in English is equals in, in some sense. If you attach a spinner or whatever other noun, most time they're equal. So the, the, the thing is that uh, the left-handed fermion behaves different from the right-handed fermion, how they interact with other particles. For example, the only the left-handed particles, only the, okay. This is where that all this confusion comes from is Psi plus, is often called the left-handed, and the Poseidon minus is always called it right-handed, which is only clear how, you know, the upper and lower half of a Dirac spinner has anything to do with hands. But they will. <laughs> they, but they will say it in today's tutorial that uh, there is a sense why they related to hands and the hands be related, be referred to as left-handed or right-handed. But for now, it's a name. And the idea is that uh, if you do that and you look at our particle world, only the left-handed will inter participate in the so-called weak interaction, and the right-handed right -handed doesn't. Which is why that when they saw the beta decay back then, you would, you would say only left-handed electron decay, but you wouldn't know that. But when you get to the, on the other side, because the neutrino is so close to be massless, you will only see the right-hand side, right-handed antineutrino. But you will have a whole lot of a taste about the chiral theory of standard model, so I'll just leave that for <laughs> the coming up course. But we should do a consistent check, consistency check is to calculate a gamma five in chiral representation, but it's 
a silly calculation to on board, and it's in the lecture notes. It's just the result is one and the minus one. They are two dimensional identities. Then you can see p plus is just one, zero. p minus is zero, one. So indeed, in the Carol Well presentation, we have psi plus just pick up the upper component and psi minus pick up the lower. So the definition agrees. In a particular nice, gamma 5 is diagonal representation. It agrees with our naive observation is that the upper half transforms some way, lower half transforms the other. And in any other representation, since gamma 5 always exists, you can always build your projection operator that way. And because of a nice property of gamma 5, this is a valid projection operator. You can always define your wall spinner this way. It's representation independent, which is nice. So we're going to move on to something related, sort of. Do we have any questions on well and the Carroll spinner? Carry on. So basically, we're talking about something sort of making Dirac spinner simpler. The other related topic, there is another way to make Dirac spinner simpler. So, so far, we just automatically assume the Dirac spinner is complex, which is right. So why that, uh, that assuming Dirac spinner is complex is a great idea. Yeah? There are some complex eigenvalues. There are some... Of the... You, 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 are, you are pointing to that matrix? Yeah. Excellent. The Lorentz transformation says, ha! <laughs> You're welcome to choose a real spinner to begin with. I'll rotate my frame. You'll end up with a complex spinner. So it's totally a great idea to start out with a complex spinner because even if you don't, you will end up with a complex spinner. Unless if all those matrices, because you know, when you were in the first two weeks, you're like, well, complex. Scalar, they have four, two components. It, it's much easier to study the scalar, just the real scalar. So the question we ask, is there, is it, is there a real spinner? Well, certainly this thing doesn't exist in the representation we're in now. But is there a chance? Say that, uh, what if? We can find a representation such that s mu nu star equals s mu nu, which is what we mean by a real spinner, is that uh, if we manage to get all the Lorentz generators to be real, then if we start out with a real spinner, it will remain real in any frame. OK, so let's look at that. This condition says, I'll throw the a quarter away because it doesn't matter. And then there is this guy called um, Mayor Anna that he realized if I can find the representation such that Gamma mu's are purely imaginary. All of them. Then I can fulfill the bill says all my Lorentz generator will be real. Then I can just impose the reality condition psi star equals psi. And then I end up with a real spinner. And this thing was successfully done. I find a representation of Dirac 
algebra precisely have this property? It's pure imaginary. Do I, I don't know if I want to try to remember it. It's something, so basically it's built up with sigma twos. And then I, so the, the other ones has I's. Okay. This, you are definitely not required to remember. As you can see, I have no idea what I'm writing. <laughs> but it's up to some minus signs that I should check. It's, it's a matrix, it's four matrices, has some sigmas that, uh, I'm, I lost them two minus sign. Here. The important thing is they are pure imaginary and they satisfy the Dirac algebra. And he says, yeah, I found a real Dirac's real spinner. And of course, the spinner is named after him, Marana spinner. And this spinner is particularly important because people well, people before realize neutrino are um, massive. Well, no, people after realize neutrino is massive, and then they try to describe neutrino with the spinner because they are real. Well, okay. Yes, you have, you have learned this. If we have a real field, then there's no charge. So if a particle is neutral and it's a fermion, then it's possible it's described by a real spinner. So again, it's related to our real reality. Something, sometimes we study things have nothing to do with re reality. But, but sometimes we do. Okay, so of course we ask again, can we do this in all representation? Because it's hard to describe your theory and make some prediction that uh, with the haunting thought that it only valids in one representation. It's not a good theory, because there are many, many representations. They are all equivalent. But uh, see, OK, I want, we want to do something, let's say it's a quotation mark reality condition. So here is the question. What's wrong with imposing this? If we're not in that particular basis, if we are in any basis like the ones we have been very fond of, this well parallel basis, what's wrong with this? We can't do it. But why? Why not? Question mark. Why shouldn't we do this? Initially, that if, like, yeah. these are the forms that the transformations take, and they'll transform you into something that's not real. Right. It doesn't only hold it in one frame. What else is wrong with it? This is a very good point. We shouldn't demand something to hold. To, to, to hold it in one frame. So if we look at our Dirac equation, let's for some reason take the complex conjugate of it and try to figure out how is the complex conjugate of Poseidon set work. Okay, so there is some complex conjugate of this thing. So in principle, Poseidon satisfied the Dirac equation for Poseidon. Poseidon star satisfied the Dirac equation for Poseidon star. And now we say, let's make it equal. Well, they better satisfy the same equation. So doing this is not going to work. 
Now we're gonna do something interesting. If I propose, maybe there is some other type of conjugation. Let's just call it a C conjugation, which is a combination of the complex conjugate. Somehow we like the idea of complex conjugate because we want to mimic that condition somehow. And it says, and hopefully we can impose this as our quotation reality condition. So because the two things that doesn't work, that we, we want it to work. So first the requirement is this new com C conjugation spinner and the Psi should transform the same way. If they transform differently, your condition only holds in one frame. And the second is they both, if we want to set them equal, should satisfy Dirac equation. And another thing, it's just a good thing about a complex conjugate, and we hope that this new conjugation we propose, if we do it twice, we'll go back to itself. And it's, if we are calling it a conjugate, So this is what we're looking for. Is that some, something we called the linear combination of Psi star. And hopefully, when you do all this linear combination, it will have such a nice property that it will transform like a Psi, satisfy the same equation with Psi, so that we can impose the condition that it actually equals Psi. Okay, we'll actually do the last one. First, the last one is easier. So we have Psi C. We want to do a C conjugation. C conjugation says use a C to multiply whatever you have inside this complex conjugate. And then we're just adding stars whenever we need to. And this guy gets had two stars, so it goes back to itself. So this gives us C C star should equal identity. So this will make it sounds more like a conjugate. So you conjugate something once and then conjugate something another time, you go back to it. Nice thing to have. Okay, so now let's go back to the first. Says that it should transform the same way. Well, let's figure out how they transform. So Psi, as we all know, transform as S lambda Psi. And this Psi C thing, the conjugated thing, is say Psi star. C. C is just a linear combination, some matrix is it doesn't transform. But this precise star does, it transform as a star of lambda precise star. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, so we have some expectation. We expect this because we, so, on the other hand, we expect this to transform just like Psi. So this whole thing should just transform like Psi. So that's our expectation. And now we can just compare the two lines, see how far are we off. So we want something like this to hold.
Well, as a star, this is just something real. All the star gets carried to the to the generator. And this this side is just the generator. Okay. I'll just move the C on this side to be a C inverse. That's always a lot to do. And it's just nice. So now you can see when we do the exponential thing, we tailor expanded the whole series. Those C minus and the C in the middle just all canceled out. And then in the end, we can just impose this guy to equals this guy. Yeah? So every term, so every term, if, if we have this, then every term, you have the C minus to the left and to the right, doesn't get a cancel. But the rest of the term, they all cancel. Yeah, does it make sense that I can do this? That it says, well, that I can just get rid of the exponential. Yeah? OK, I think we worked out the S mu nu star somewhere. Well. It equals gamma mu star, gamma nu star. And it's the same thing. I can just add some C, C inverse in between them. They're going to cancel. Yeah, question. Do know that these C's are going to commute with the epsilon mu nus, the parameters? Well, the, the epsilon mu nu is, so C is actually a matrix, and epsilon mu nu are just real parameters. They're just like theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, chi 1, chi 2, chi 3. So, okay. It's, it's a good question, because so far I have been admitting all the spinner indexes. So I should, whenever I write this beautiful thing, I should have to say that it has some spinner index. And after you expand it, these things also have spinner index. So this C thing, also because it acts on the spinner, so it's also a matrix has spinner indexes. So it wouldn't commute with S mu nu, who has also spinner index, which is a matrix. But epsilon mu nu, as you can see, as you have seen that in the homework, that you have used it in the vector representation, you use it in a spinner representation, they are just parameters. So that's why that uh, we decided to just toss them away. So uh, maybe I should emphasize that uh, as what we have done, we always suppress the spinner indices. Otherwise, each equation will take twice as long to write. It's only a few labels, but I will make a mistake. It's just that we'll just, they are all matrix multiplications, so we'll always write it as a matrix equation in a spinner sense, but it will keep track at the Lorentz index. And Lorentz index is mu and nu, and the spinner index is a and b. And you're like, why do you bother? They all run between 0 to 3, right? Well, actually, mu and nu run between 0 to 3, and a and b run between 1 to 4. OK, it's still, it's four numbers. But the, the thing is, they are, they are different representation. We shouldn't make a distinction on them. This confusion only arises because we are living in four dimensions. We live in any other space dimensions, we wouldn't have the confusion. Why mu and the new and a and the b? They all run 
they were the same numbers. But that's the reality. They shouldn't be the same. Naively, there is no reason for them to be the same. If you look at the appendix, try, which try to explain why we're in a four-dimensional spinner representation, it relies on some fun fact that uh, two to the power four minus two is two or something. No, four divided by two. <laughs> So that other one works too, but, but doesn't go together with the derivation. I, yes, yeah, so, right. So for each, for each two space dimension, they can be paired up, and each pair produce two dimension spinner representation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This this is the formula relates the space time dimension to the spinner representation dimension. And it just happens that the one, you know, it's four on the up, then you get. And I, of course, it should be like a, the, like if it's a five divided by two, you should still take like two. It shouldn't be a fraction power. But yes, that's the reason that uh, I just throw away the epsilon mu nu because they were not a spinner matrix. Okay, so what do we arrive is something like this, and we realize if gamma mu star equals C inverse gamma mu C will be all set. Well, we have a ambiguity of a sign issue. Let's call it an eta. I call it an eta just because apparently eta mu nu is the Minkowski metric that uh, has plus minus sign in it. It's just a sign that we're going to figure out. Sorry. Yeah. Can you take the conjugate of s mu nu? Yeah. Should you not get minus the commutator of gamma mu star or gamma nu? You are thinking about a dagger. When you're a dagger, you reverse the order. But if you just take complex conjugate, then you just complex conjugate. Right, okay. yeah. That will come up. That will come up in the second half of the lecture. <laughs> then we actually have to keep track of that minus. OK, so this is my, our conclusion. If this thing holds, then we'll be happy. Okay, the next thing is to figure out what, ah, this is very convenient. It's not planned, but it's convenient. That we have to make sure this guy, which we are gonna impose that it equals psi, had better be also following the same Dirac equation, which is right there. Ah, even better. So we're sort of coming back to this board. Okay, so we're just gonna plug that thing in, which is... Sorry, did you? Uh, yeah. Just raise the board a bit. Yeah, thank you. So, thank you, I should remember that. The thing I put in the box and then <laughs> it's below the pillar. Okay, so we'll just grab that thing in a box that we derive. Remember, we come up with the box condition because, again, we require that the Lorentz transformation is compatible with our condition. And what is it? See, apparently you, have, you don't have to remember this formula because I have no idea what it is. For convenience, I'll just write this term with all this same matrix. Okay. Now again, this is the thing we have been doing a long time. We just pull this C minus this side, throw the C to the other side. Aha. 
So this is indeed our Psi C conjugate spin. And we realize the sign needs to be negative. So for this guy is to agree. Okay, now it's the condition has been completely fixed. That a gamma mu star needs to equal to minus C minus gamma mu C. Together with C C star equals one. Says in any representation, look for this same matrix when you find it, then define your C conjugated to be C psi star. Then we can impose this condition, which is called a reality condition. Okay, consistency check. Remember the, the, the nice representation, Marana, Marana found, which is a simply say, ah, same matrix is one. Condition satisfied, pure imaginary. So, and, uh, you can show that in while cases, the C is given by I gamma 2. Again, no need to remember it. Well, let's see what happens to Let's just take a brief look at what this gave us. So this gives me i sigma 2 minus i sigma 2. And if I act on, since now I'm in well spinner, I can just split it up this way. And now I impose it equals it itself. you get i sigma 2 w minus minus i sigma 2 w plus. And you can show these two equations are one, they imply each other. So basically you can write a Dirac spinner as w plus and a minus i sigma 2 w plus. Ha! That shows explicitly that uh, the rock spinner has been simplified, which only has two degrees of two. Okay, I can't say that yet, but uh, it become a two. Com it's completely determined by a two component spinner. Before it needs two two component spin spinner to determine. It. And as you say, this major my on um, Condition relates the lower half of the Dirac spinner with the upper half, or all the other way. And the well condition just say half of them disappear. So those two conditions are incompatible and it cannot be imposed simultaneously. But this is actually only true, well, it is true in four dimensions, but there are other dimensions that this is not true. So if you talk to a string theorist who works either in two dimension or 10 dimension, it's actually interesting if you work out the whole thing out, the conditions can be both in. And there is a reference on Wiki that you can read about. But in four dimension, you can't impose them together because as you say, this is the Mariana condition and the wild condition says the other half disappeared. It just can't simultaneously be true. And you again, why do I care? <laughs> well, it's related to why, why do I care to impose a reality condition? But as we have said, that in scalar field, the real scalar compared with the complex scalar means it doesn't have a charge, it's neutral. And the existence and the existence of the neutrino make us very interested in neutral formula. Okay, break 
story time. Okay, so we spend uh, a long time to make sure uh, that our equation is uh, sensible. It makes sense. So now we have an equation that we are confident that it's a good equation. What should we do? Yeah. Nobody wants to do it. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we're going to do it. So we'll find the solutions. Oh, come on. We have to do it. Remember what do we do with the scalar equation? Oh, that one is easy. You can just write the e to the ikx solved. <laughs> and, but the problem is we do need uh, the solution, and then we can find some coefficients, then we can promote them to operator. But so what else? There is no way we can avoid this solving this equation. So let's solve it. Okay. So some. We're going to try to write the gamma. Okay. Where is the gamma? Yeah, I didn't write it up. We're going to solve it in a particular representation. Like it's very hard to solve it, you know, without knowing the representation. And this is gamma i. And then there's the people coming up with the brilliant idea says that we can combine this together to be one to write a four component poly matrix such that I can write the gamma matrix more compactly as sigma mu, sigma bar mu. And I put the minus nine. Okay, so now we can start solving the equation. Well, by assuming it's a plane wave. Surprise. Okay, so we're going to solve the positive frequency first. We're assuming it's some plane wave. And then this thing is just the spinner thing. It's a four component thing. That's what we are after. If a scalar, you can just say, I don't need it. All right, so we have I gamma, gamma mu partial mu minus M acting on psi given by zero. And then the i partial mu is basically just bring down the minus i p nu. Right? That's all it does. So i stays here. Partial just brings the minus i p nu. And that's all we need about this pulling wave part. And now we don't need it because there's no expert dependence. We'll just get rid of it. So this says gamma mu p mu minus m equals zero. I can write it in a matrix minus m. It's just the identity. Gamma mu dot p mu. It is just that sigma dot p, sigma bar dot p, see? It's a very brilliant way of unite the sigma matrix and the identity. Yeah? Uh, the first equation that you wrote in the first line, Yeah. how do you know the left-hand side is independent of p? The left-hand side? The, the line above here, yes. psi is independent of p. Oh, it's not. Because, oh, sure. as a fun, and, and also a function of x. Oh, good question. 
So what we're going to do later is to give another linear coefficient and the integrator over the moment of space. And that thing is what I should have called it psi x. So let's just say a, a particular solution. Okay. You're right. Since it has some p dependence, let's not call it psi. So let's carry on. This is just splitting the U into two parts. And then, um, now let me be lazy and then drop the momentum dependence, but they do depend on the momentum. Then we have Then we have some coupled equation. Let's, I'll, I'm just writing it nicely, in a nice way. Okay, so far it's, it's just algebra. There's nothing tricky, it's matrix multiplication, not even matrix multiplication. It, oh, it is, there's a matrix. But anyway, so we get this thing. So now we're going to show a interesting identity. If you work out this guy, so let's re work out this guy. This guy is P0. P0 plus Pi sigma i, and this is P0 minus Pj sigma j. And the first term is P0 square. The cross term disappeared, and you get this. Only the symmetric part matters. Get M square. It's a very interesting identity. Show by just explicitly work it out. But this interesting identity means that this two equation actually equivalent. If you multiply the first equation by sigma bar p, okay, probably to the left, but then we just show that this guy is just m squared. Then you get, then you delete an M, you get to the bottom. So well, I need to solve one of them. So now, we're just gonna propose. So let, let's, let's write to this thing I want to solve. And here is a proposed solution. It says, I just take u1 equals to this thing times some arbitrary two-component spinner. 
And if we plug it in, you realize this. So, solved it. This is the solution of Dirac equation. And the Cassie prime is just some arbitrary two component spinner. You can pick it to be whatever you want. But normally you don't see this this way. If you write your spinner this way, it's 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 just not a symmetrical and pretty. So the way to make it a pretty is to write a sigma dot p as square root of sigma dot p and write m as a square root of m square, which is sigma dot p sigma bar. Dot p, and now you can just get rid of the common thing, and what you are left with is this guy. So this is what you often see as the positive frequency solution of the Dirac. And normally, you would say, you say, say it's a two-component spinner. Of course, a normal choice is just take one of them to be one zero and take another one to be zero one. But you can also just be fancy and um, mathematical and claim that uh, you can pick some spin label, which we'll see in the Friday morning tutorial why they deserve the name spin label, but you can just impose that they are a complete, uh, also normal set uh, of good spinners. Okay, so that's how you solve the Dirac equation. It doesn't take that long. Take about 10 minutes, then you can solve the Dirac equation and get a solution. Well, of course, that I put out this trick out of my head. You have to know this ahead of time, but this is the solution. And we call it uh, UP. And there is some, some constant that has been taken away. So that the con so you have this some constant, you get a Absorb it into the side. Okay. I, yes, question. Just to clarify, are you setting that C equal to those two spinners? I'm setting this C. Well, I can to set it. So this is just one orthogonal condition. You can set it to be cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta, in general. Yep. I, I need to spin, but it's nice, you know, if it is. It's the norm is one and it's orthogonal to the other one. But a one zero zero one works perfectly. Okay, so by the enthusiasm, I saw that uh, when I start solving this equation, I, I conclude that nobody wants to see me solve the other half. Well, remember, we do have the, the other one, which is the negative frequency part, so this guy. I'll just write down the result. The, the, the steps are changing minus sign somewhere, and it, you just end up with this guy. You don't have to remember the solution. If I, ask, if I want to ask you any question on the solution, I'll give you the solution. I might ask you two further questions about it. And again, eta can be chosen 1, 0, or 0, 1. But you can also be fancy and arbitrary says that I require them, they are just two things that I require them to be orthogonal. OK, now I need a big board. Because now we have all kinds of solution. that I should combine them. 
this is the key, first key result of today's lecture, is that now we have all the possible solution. We should just take some arbitrary, arbitrary coefficient and combine them together and do a gigantic integral and find the Dirac field. And here it is. So psi x. Okay, I think I then spend a lot of time trying to persuade uh, this is the correct normalization, to, but, uh, but all the normalization are correct. So we just put it out there. And now I'll write uh, some coefficients of the first guy, which is e to the i minus i p x. And the other half is from C star and the V, which is that guy, B to the I. Yes. Okay, let me write it once that there is some spin, those curious spin label. These things should all have a spin label. It just says there are two solutions. One of them always the psi equals one zero, the other one psi equals zero one. So these things actually have spin labels on them, and they should be sum. You sum all possible solutions, give them linear coefficient, and that's our Dirac field. Okay, while I was writing lecture notes, I realized it's really annoying to write this factor and they all cancel out whatever I'm calculating. <laughs> Actually, all the commutator, whatever, like all, they all have some normalization factor and they all work it out. So from now on, I will never write this again. I'll call this thing a momentum volume integral with appropriate two pi's and whatever. So it will be all hidden there. And you will see throughout the rest of the lectures, they will all, whenever you do an integral, you have some two pi to the cube, two e, and they just miraculously cancels out the thing on the denominator. So I don't want to write the same thing twice. They just cancel. It's a lot of chalk. And it's also a lot of factors to keep, keep track. So that's just how I'm going to write it. You don't have to adapt, adopt to this convention, but whenever you say I want to integral over some momentum, it means it's a three-dimensional integral with this factor. Okay. Interestingly, so this is a very great. That's that's the way we are almost ready. We are almost ready to quantize this thing, but. Uh, we need a Lagrange. We still don't have a Lagrange. So in the next uh, 13 minutes, let's see if we can find the Lagrange. Oh. We definitely need it because the, the kinetic term will give us some propagator, the interaction term will enable us to do perturbation theory. We kind of st stay with the occupation forever. Time to do some analytical mechanics stuff. So how do I find this? Well, we all learned from scalar theory that uh, complex scalar, okay, I'm just being, I'll find an easy one to work on too, first. I'll work on the mass term. The mass term is just given by phi star phi for complex clear. I hope you remember this vividly. With some mass somewhere, let's figure that, that out later. Okay, so now I have a spinner. I'll make a first guess. I'll just guess it's psi dagger psi. There's no way not to guess this. This worked for 
series before. Okay. Well, it's a Lagrangian. And again, I have to mention the same great name again that uh, it should be Lorenzi invariant. And let's work this out. So the psi will transform as S psi. Psi dagger, on the other hand, will transform psi dagger as lambda dagger. So this thing transforms as psi dagger as lambda dagger as lambda psi. Wouldn't it be nice if the last lambda dagger times s lambda just equals one and the happy ending? Is it possible? Some people shaking hand head because we are because I will hardly show that this thing cannot be unitary. There is actually a theorem in group theory against our wish. This Lorentz group is non-compact, so we can't find any unitary representation that is finite dimension. Since we work on in four, in four dimension representation, okay, we're screwed. This thing is not going to be invariant. But let's see what we can learn about this S dagger thing. So S dagger lambda is equals to e to the one half S epsilon mu nu S mu nu dagger, because everything else is real. Okay, we need to work out S mu nu dagger. And uh, the mention the negative sign is going to show up. So this guy equals gamma mu, gamma nu's commutator dagger. Okay, I'll do it carefully. I say, let's write out the commutator and take a dagger of it. And dagger says we need to take dagger of things and reverse the order. Ha ha. Index. Where? Right. Okay, so this gives us gamma new dagger, gamma new dagger. Okay. But we know how this dagger is transformed. It just pick up a bunch of gamma zero. And the gamma zeros can just be taken out. And this is equals to minus gamma zero as mu nu gamma zero. So now we can work out what's S dagger lambda. We'll give a minute. It's, the calculation has many lines, but each line are hopefully trivial. If not, I will give you more gamma matrices to manipulate. Okay. But hopefully I don't do. Okay. So hopefully you are following now. Let's just plug this thing back here. Again, by the same argument, the gamma zero is basically square root of one. So I can just pull it out. Minus sign. Uh oh. Then this is S lambda inverse. because there's a minus sign, and it's exponential. 
Okay. Well, well, one line from finding glorious moments. So black psi dagger psi we transform as psi dagger gamma zero s inverse lambda. It's very close to s inverse lambda, but so that's how psi dagger transform, and this is how psi transform. Oh, I can't move this board. So I'd better not to use too much more space. Okay, this is how this thing transform. You are like 20 minutes early. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So let's stare at this thing. It'll be neat. Well, it's actually necessarily important that this s inverse meet the s somewhere otherwise it, it would never be invariant so how do we make them meet see what the commutator between s and theory is there is something in between what's the remedy of gamma zero and s inverse you need to switch them. I, I need to switch them but uh, what if like i put something more <laughs> Sometimes more is less. <laughs> yes? Is there any remedy? You can put something there and somehow... Remember, gamma zero is just square root of one. Yeah? Gamma zero. Put, hmm? another gamma zero. put another gamma zero. So if I somehow insert another gamma zero there, and then this will disappear and this will disappear. Right? Gamma zero will meet the gamma zero. S will meet the Everest inverse. So since this is right in between where the two Psi dagger and Psi transform, so let's insert it right here. So it's Psi dagger gamma zero Psi. And how this thing is going to work is I have all this thing followed by a gamma zero and followed by this. And gamma zero meets gamma zero. S lambda meets S inverse lambda, and I'm left with the gamma zero, which is good because I insert one. I suppose the better I get it back. So this thing is actually Lorentz invariant. It's a scalar, and actually this thing is so important that it's called the Dirac conjugate. And we'll from now on write down things like Psi bar Psi. Okay. Yeah, we find one term, we find the mass term of the Lagrangian by proposing something that doesn't work, but um, fix it by inserting some gamma zero somewhere. Okay, so I guess I have just enough time to get the other term. See if this, this will fit the bill. So the idea is this precise bar is so nice. <laughs> Excellently nice. You always wonder, this gamma things, it has nothing to do with a Lorentz vector. Why are you carrying a vector index? Well, here there is a reason. Finally, we have the chance to say why this is carrying a, gum, the, a vector index. Is it wouldn't it be nice that whenever you use psi bar and psi to build a stuff, they all transform nicely in Lorentz transformation? And we know that whenever we write down any Lagrangian in fermion, we just make sure to remember to use two fermions, psi bar, psi, in this form. Okay, so basically, we want this guy to transform as this. Ooh, then we get a Lorentz vector. And what this guy actually transform? Well, it transform as Psi dagger. Well, it transform with all these things. I insert a gamma zero, I inserted another gamma mu. 
And the other side is the other side. So this thing, that gamma zero come with it. So up to there is just how psi dagger transform. There's another gamma zero, that's the point. Okay, this first is psi bar, and this give you this, and you get a gamma mu, and you get this. So I want whatever in between transform like a vector. Well, you all know how to do this. You expand it in linear expansion and trying to figure out what, what kind of conditions we get. But actually, if you have been somehow have a great memory of yesterday's lecture, this is ex exactly the condition we impose on S so that a Dirac equation is covariant in the first place. Remember in Dirac equation, this is what I would exactly we want. If we, want, we look at the Dirac equation, indeed, we're sort of hoping gamma mu will transform in the opposite, in a way, such to cancel the Psi transformation and that vector index on the partial mu. So this is the same requirement. Requiring this is a vector is the same as requiring the Dirac equation transform with the vector. So now we find our second candidate to use uh, build our Lagrangian, and we can just simply write it down because we just need a Poisson bar, right? We have all the rest of the stuff already. This is the best Euler Lagrangian equation you've ever done. It doesn't depend on Poisson partial Poisson bar. The Euler Lagrangian equation literally reads as partial L, partial psi bar, and it will give us the Dirac equation. There's nothing to be done. This is the Dirac. And we have shown this term is Lorentz invariant. The other term is also Lorentz invariant. Okay, this is a great time to stop. We have the solution, we have the Lagrangian, and we're going to talk a lot more about the Lagrangian.